Wysłuchamy w tej chwili drugiego wystąpienia. Naszym gościem jest pan Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, matematyk francuski, człowiek o niezwykle bogatej biografii naukowej. Wspomnę tutaj o tym, że jest członkiem Akademii Europea, jest także od 2002 roku członkiem Królewskiej Hiszpańskiej Akademii Nauk, był prezydentem francuskiego Towarzystwa Matematycznego oraz prezydentem Europejskiego. Europejskiego Towarzystwa Matematycznego. Od 2014 roku przewodniczy Ra Europejskiej Radzie do Spraw Badań Naukowych i z tej perspektywy postanowił się podzielić z nami swymi refleksjami na temat doskonałości, dążenia do doskonałości naukowej. Pan przewodniczący także w swym y, tytule stawia pytanie brzmiące Critical Elements for Sciences to Thrive. Um, Mr. President, it is a great pleasure to invite you on stage to give a lecture. Honorable ministers, magnificences, dear colleagues, thank you for inviting me today to speak at this conference, which is clearly very important for the future of higher education and research in Poland. I understand that, you are, that it is taking place during a time of intense reflection about how to develop further science in Poland based on analysis of the past. And no doubt you will be receiving lots of advice and recommendations, not least from a peer review being carried out under the lead of the European Commission's policy support facility. It is not my intention to try and offer detailed policy recommendations for Poland here today. However, I would like to make some observations about the process of reform in general, and then to set out some basic principles which I believe are instrumental to make individual scientists thrive, principles which I think have a form of universal relevance. Firstly, from my years-long experience of taking part in and seeing reform efforts around the world, I would like to suggest that there is no one set of institutions and policies which you can take off the shelf and set up in a given country here, Poland, which will guarantee the outcomes you want. So you should be aware of generic advice. Each country faces a different set of conditions, a different history which has shaped its institutional environment. As a result, in a given country, policymakers need to create the conditions in which researchers working there can flourish. This is not just my opinion. Last year, a study funded by the Danish Council for Research and Innovation Policy, DFAIR, was, uh, was published. It looked at the relationship between the research policy and research performance over the 30-year period from 1980 to, to 2013. It found that there was a stable group of top performing countries over this period, but that this group is I quote, very diverse in terms of how the national science systems are organized and funded. According to this literature, there is not one optimal national science policy model, but rather a number of quite different models which all have shown high performance for several decades, end of quote. But there is one striking feature that all the top performing country, countries do share and that is a long-term commitment to supporting research and stability in the funding and governance conditions. So my second observation is the need to be patient and to adopt a long-term perspective. These countries, which now enjoy good research conditions, do so only because of wise and patient investments over many years. I don't say this to encourage complacency or argue against the need for reform. 
saying that th there is not a single way forward doesn't mean that any way forward will deliver good outcomes. But it can take many years for the actors in a system to react to the incentives and structures put in place around them. As a result, such a commitment cannot be the project of a single minister or ministry. They must be buy-in across governments and in long term by the scientific community. Too often, we see a kind of boom and bust in research funding in certain countries as administrations change. My third point, such a commitment should aim at making the national system become at some point competitive through national resources and in the European context be able to twin in the right way with others, in particular as far as researchers are concerned. In 2014, the overall gross domestic expenditures on research and development, so-called GERD, G-E-R-D, in the European Union was 284 billion euros, about 100 billion of which was spent by the public sector. In the same year, the European Union support to research and innovation was around 9 billion euro. That is less than 10% of the total public fund spending. It is therefore obvious that, with its present size, the EU support to research cannot address alone all of the issues facing science in Europe. Hence, funding coming from the EU cannot replace national funding, but it can provide key reference points and support some ambitious project, as the ERC is doing, while of course also highly facilitating transnational cooperation. Still, for the foreseeable future, the primary responsibility for funding basic research in Europe lies at the national level. The duty of us having responsibilities at the European and national levels is to find the optimal combination of strategies, each taking advantage of spatial situations. The EU is providing a wonderful platform for sharing best practices and reacting and creating enriching sorry critical mass when needed. Its programs must be fit for these purposes, and the scientific community must make its voice heard to achieve that. So far, I've suggested that Poland needs to, to make a national commitment to research, to develop its own solutions, and to give to give them time to work. I now turn to the critical elements I believe allow individual scientists to thrive. There are three main elements. First, we must not forget that the most essential element is the researchers themselves, the human beings that make things work. The second element I want to emphasize is the need for researchers to have the time and freedom to explore new knowledge. And third, I would like to stress the need for diversity, risk-taking, and interdisciplinarity in science. During my time in Brussels, I've been very struck by the way policymakers of all nationalities talk about research. They talk a lot of structures and systems, of synergies, critical mass, and leakages, of ecosystems and societal challenges. There are lots of references to GERD and BERD and the RED's intensity and numbers of publications, but very little discussion of the work of scientists themselves and what makes young people decide to do research. So let me stress again that for me, one of the critical elements for the performance of a research system is to give room for initiative to the right people, attracting some of them and retaining others. Without the right basic conditions for researchers, the quality of research is affected. Anybody entering a demanding working environment, such as ours, wants to be assured that there is a chance of a career, of advancement, of reward. We should not be surprised to see when the basic conditions are not met, the best researchers simply leave to carry out their research elsewhere or leave research altogether. Any country or region which wants to develop its science therefore needs to get these basic conditions right. In particular, 
we need to plot out a sustainable career path for talented young researchers from wherever they come. In some countries, this has to be invented. We must consider employment and working conditions, open, transparent, and merit-based recruitment, without forgetting, of course, an improved position for women in research. You should remember that presently, 26% of the workforce in research is, consists of women. This can only be achieved in an appropriate balance if found between competitive and institutional funding. We must look at ways to enhance the training, skills, and experience of researchers in Europe. We must give consideration to the possibility of reconciling professional and private life. Most of all, we need to consider researchers not just as researchers, but as people. For young researchers, having the possibility of being exposed early to other research environments is critical, provided they can do that without having to rush from one year position to the next, a situation which leaves no room for maturing some scientific reflection and constructing a personal strategy. Such a complementary training is typically offered by a well-built postdoctoral program such as the one set up by the Swiss National Fund. Thus, this leads me to the second element for the performance of a research system, which is that it has to guarantee scientific freedom for researchers. There has always been an inherent tension between the demands of policymakers for relevance and impact and the deeply rooted interest of scientists in curiosity-driven research. But I believe that this apparent contradiction is mostly a false one. Let me explain why. According to OECD's latest innovation strategy from 2015, I'm quoting, public investment in scientific research is widely recognized as an essential feature of effective national innovation systems. Public research plays a key role in innovation systems by providing new knowledge and pushing the knowledge frontier. Universities and public research institutions often undertake longer-term, higher-risk research and complement the activities of the private sector. Although the volume of public R&D is less than 30% of the total OECD R&D expenditures, universities and public research institutions perform more than three-quarters of the total basic research." End of quote. So nobody really disputes that technological progress requires both basic or curiosity-driven research and applied research. Nor is it disputed that governments need to fund basic research. The fundamental reason for pressure on impact is that the applications of such research cannot be foreseen with a possibly long time lag between fundamental discoveries and the exploitation. So why then does the basic research community feel under constant pressure to justify its activities and budget? Paradoxically, one misunderstanding may arise from the many successes of the past. As people have seen a sustained stream of findings, technologies and innovations appear decade after decade, some people may have come to think of it as an easy, and in the end, predictable process. Non-scientists could therefore grow impatient and imagine they can order whatever innovations or impacts they might like as it from a menu. But of course, we, we know that science does not and actually cannot work that way. All technologies harness natural phenomena. These phenomena exist in the world regardless of our desires. Nobody decided one day that better means of communication were needed and then somebody discovered electromagnetic waves. They were found by Heinrich Hertz emphasizing the beauty of physics. He based his work on the theoretical consideration of some James Clark Maxwell. The basic circuits used in computers were not found to, by people who wanted to build computers. They were discovered in the 1930s by physicists counting nuclear particles, a topic of interest to them. In 2012, Jennifer Doudna was one of the first to recognize the significance of CRISPR, 
leading to a totally new approach to genetic engineering. She began to work in this area because she thought the chemistry might be cool. So I feel scientists need to do a better job of explaining how science works and how challenging and difficult it is. We need to be honest that not every project or research program will deliver a breakthrough in knowledge. But that doesn't matter. The channels through which basic research feeds into economy are many and diverse. The whole story cannot be only occasional breakthroughs. Fundamentally, basic research increases the stock of useful knowledge, both the kind which is written down, for example, by, in scientific publications, and the kind that people carry around in their heads, for example, skills, know-how, and experience. But it also trains skilled graduates in solving complex problems, produces new scientific instruments and methodologies, creates international peer networks which transmit the latest knowledge and can even raise new questions about societal values and choices. The private sector is very much aware of the needs for highly qualified personnel, as they too know that what makes the difference, finally, is the quality of the people they employ. These channels are the way knowledge spreads around the world and becomes widely used. From the point of view of any one region or country, even for the most scientifically advanced regions in the world today, the majority of new and existing knowledge is developed outside that region or country. A national science base is not therefore primarily about producing national science. It is about gaining access to all the knowledge that has ever been created or will ever be created anywhere in the world with, of course, the hope to contribute directly and to take advantage of it. This is why it is short-sighted not to allow researchers some space to explore the latest frontiers of knowledge rather than only what might be useful today. They will not automatically produce something revolutionary if they do this, although they might, but they will be able to identify and assimilate potentially exploitable knowledge produced elsewhere if working in that area. This brings me to my final element, the need for diversity, risk-taking, and interdisciplinarity in science. I'm convinced that the healthy science system needs diversity and the European Union, by its very nature, does provide such a diversity while having developed compatibility checking mechanisms and circulation tools such that the Mary Slodowska Curie actions. They are of vital importance for young researchers and especially efficient in their early circulation. This was another clear finding of the report I mentioned earlier. I'm quoting, competitiveness in research tends to be a package. Some, no, some nations perform well at both a specific and a more general level, while others perform less well across the board. With very few exceptions, all leading scientific nations, both smaller ones, such as Switzerland, Denmark, and the Netherlands, and larger ones, such as the US and UK, are thus world leading, not only overall, but also in many individual scientific disciplines. This indicates that excellence in individual disciplines or fields of research is hard to attain without a system that supports excellence at the more general level." End of quote. In other words, in the real world, we do not find examples of strongly performing countries that are specialized in a subset of scientific areas. And it is almost universally accepted that some of the best research and some of the research with the biggest impact lies outside firm disciplinary boundaries. As a consequence, there is need for a variety of effective programs to support research. The evaluation must involve people with an inside knowledge of the practices of the discipline and of the environment in which researchers operate. But ensuring scientific freedom and diversity is not just an issue for policymakers and funding bodies. In each country, the scientific community must also look at itself. We, scientists, cannot ask for scientific freedom from the funders and then tie our ends behind our backs. 
And if we are honest, we must recognize that the academic community tends to be conservative. The quality of the selection mechanisms in the system is therefore one of the most decisive factors. The whole evaluation process is founded on the capabilities and caliber of the evaluators and reviewers. They need a wide understanding of scientific developments. They have to be broad-minded and not to adhere to rigid schools of thought. The criteria and guidelines that funders such as, such as us give to research leaders also matter for the evaluation process, but also for other processes like hiring and promotion decisions. Because we can be conservatives not just in terms of science, but in what we regard as the right way to do science and the right type of scientific career. So, in conclusion, I'm very pleased to see that Poland has embarked on the important journey of reflecting on the organization of its higher education and research system. For me, it is very important that they be considered in their close interaction. I am aware that you have traveled a long way already, but such an endeavor is necessarily a long-term effort and will require long-term commitments. If you were expecting from me some secret source or shortcut, I have to disappoint you as I just know none. I can take, it can take years to create even one school attracting top researchers in the world. I would like to give you one example in my own country and my own discipline of a very worrying situation which was turned around and led to great success. In the 70s in France, the creation of computer science departments in universities was made almost exclusively by taking away positions from mathematics departments. This led to an almost full stoppage of the recruitment in mathematics departments. In the early 1980s, I was personally, personally confronted with this situation as I was chairing the National Committee for Mathematics in the CNRS. And the number of positions which could be attributed every year was very small. In 1987, mathematicians organized a national conference entitled Mathematics Avenir, Mathematics to Come, aiming mainly at politicians and journalists to convince them that the French capacity to develop mathematics at the highest level was in great danger. It was the first effort of this type ever made in the country. The event was met with considerable success while the main newspapers were devoting special pages to speak about the challenges of mathematics. Its conclusion became the basis for the decision taken shortly after the re-election of François Mitterrand as President of the Republic, to give back to mathematics the positions taken away as consequence of the creation of a directorship dedicated to mathematics in the ministry, the first of its kind. This led to a steady flow of hirings in ma of mathematicians in the next 10 years with the possibility of offering them some career perspectives. This produced a wealth of very successful mathematicians, in particular specialists of probability theory and nonlinear partial differential equations, two domains which had not been developed so widely, among, which, among whom fields medalists Fenlin Werner and Cédric Villani. This proves that changing the trend can be done. There are institutions which prove themselves as magnets, most of the time by combining great scientific leadership by some outstanding individuals and quality facilities with the appropriate flexibility to accommodate the needs of top research. You certainly have several difficult decisions ahead of you. I wish you all the best in your efforts, and I have no doubt that if, after having embarked in the right directions, you maintain your efforts and commitment, you will get to where you want to be. Thank you very much.